Welcome back everyone to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Today I'm going to share some comments about Canto 31 of Purgatorio. After the lovely Chiara was my guest to comment uh, Canto 30th in the last, the last video, and I'm hoping that she will be able to come back and uh, uh, present uh, some Cantos of Paradiso together with me as well. Canto 31 is a straight continuation of Canto 30. There are a couple of things that I would like to highlight from the very beginning and they are really central of this canto. And also that the very first time I read it, the very first time I read Purgatorio, I think I missed in particular because they are not made uh, very explicit by Dante. The very first thing uh, is the position and the importance of Beatrice's eyes. Beatrice's eyes have all the meaning that Dante wants to give them and even more because it's a, a mirror, they are a mirror, they are a portal, a portal through which Dante can see Jesus and, and the divine and a portal through which Dante can actually access the divine in Paradiso. And in Paradiso, we will see many, many times uh, instances where uh, Dante, the poet, the poet, is using Beatrice's eyes as uh, a way to help Dante, the character, the pilgrim, uh, better understand something, in other words, to see something through her eyes. This uh, concept of Beatrice's eyes as uh, a real mirror of the truth is incredible because it's... Uh, it's so true, it, it's really so true when it comes to a beloved person, the person that we love in our life. And in Dante's case, the very first person that he fell in love with. So one thing that I missed the very first time I read this canto is the fact that uh, Beatrice does not turn her eyes on Dante's eyes, for the entirety of this canto, the previous canto, number 30, and this one as well. So he, she actually looks in his eyes only at the very end of canto 31, after he's been uh, washed with the waters of the river Lithia. And from the very beginning of Purgatorio, we have highlighted and realized the importance of water as a symbol, but just water as an image, as a, an element, for the sense of purification that comes together with Purgatorio. Purgatory is the cantica of mercy, and there is no mercy without the link with water. So we have a lot of water in this canto as well. The second thing I'd like to highlight is the progression of uh, Dante's uh, process of uh, confessing his sins and being purified. There is a clear um, reference to Purgatorio Canto 9, where, if you remember, Dante showed us the three different, the, the three steps to the door of Purgatorio in three different colors and materials. The first one was white, the second one was black, all rugged, and the third one was red as blood, um, meaning that in Dante's, while the church officially had outlined uh, the steps of the sacrament of penitence or confession as uh, contrition, confession, and uh, satisfaction, Dante seems to flip and switch the first two and present them as uh, confession, contrition, and satisfaction. Therefore, white, black, and red steps in order to enter Purgatorio. Now, this has a lot to do with uh, the structure of Canto 31 because First of all, we have this uh, uh, confession that Beatrice explicitly asks Dante to make. She says, uh, Di se questo è vero, a tanta accusa tua confession conviene essere congiunta. Uh, in Mandelbaum, your confession must be entwined with such accusation, with such self-accusation. It's not only her desire, but this is how divine justice works. So he has to confess, just like every other character in Purgatorio so far, if we remember, has been doing. 
they have been uh, confessing their responsibilities, their faults, their sins, spontaneously without blaming anybody else but themselves. So Dante is being asked to do precisely that. And to Dante's confessio oris in Latin, or confession from through the mouth, confessio oris, must follow his uh, contritio cordis, or contrition of the heart. When Dante has confessed in this canto, then he feels this uh, sense of contrition that he's supposed to feel, and it's so intense that it will make him faint, he will lose his senses. Which actually leads me to the third point that I'd like to highlight here, which is also very important. We've seen all throughout the Divine Comedy how Dante plays with uh, uh, recalling canto from canto, not only in terms of a vertical reading of the Divine Comedy, but also making some uh, references through codes and keys that he peppers here and there. Now, there is one here that I had already mentioned at the end of my video about Inferno, canto number five. And this key, there are always kind of three-pronged keys because he always uses the number three, Dante. Um, this key is uh, at verse eight, um, 10, and 12, precisely in the words spense, pense, and offense. The translation here is, um, what are you thinking? This is what Beatrice is asking him. What are you thinking? Reply to me, the water has not yet obliterated your sad memories. You haven't been in Lite yet. Confusion mixed with fear, compelled a yes, etc. So these three words in rhyme, they are precisely the same three words that we have found already in Inferno 5. Before Dante fainted in Inferno 5, there are two moments of fainting, and probably the only two moments of fainting, where Dante is fainting purely of his own uh, intensity of feeling in uh, the Divine Comedy. In uh, Inferno 5, because of his feeling of pity, deep, deep uh, pity, uh, we already said that there is a mystery around it, but very likely Dante was feeling uh, a self-reflection when uh, looking and at Francesca and listening to Francesca and Paolo's story. So there is something very personal about that story. Here, we cannot say that it's pity that he's feeling uh, and that it makes him faint. The reason why he's fainting here is more uh, uh, contrition, his own contrition, his own sense of guilt for his own sins. It's so intense, he understand, un understands the wrong of his own sins so well, finally, that it's so intense that he cannot take it and he faints. Let's remember that Dante had uh, some kind of nervous condition. It might have been epilepsy, we we're not sure. But in La Vita Nova, in his uh, autobiographical book, he actually describes moments when, uh, even one time in particular in La Vita Nova, he describes a moment when he went into a sort of a party, a court, where he realized that Beatrice might have been there, and uh, he loses his balance, his physical balance for a moment, and he has to grab a wall or something to avoid falling down. And people around him noticed that, and almost uh, there were some women, some girls who laughed at him or mocked him for this. This tells me even more um, the fact that he was so beyond being simply a sensitive person or hypersensitive that this moment of uh, falling in love with Beatrice must have been so um, intense and shattering for him that uh, it's not too surprising to imagine that he waited so many years. She died in uh, 1290 or 95. And he waited at least 15 years or 20 years to write this scene where his eyes are finally meeting her eyes again, and not only in a physical way, or simply of sight, but in, more importantly, in the sense of the realignment of Dante's spirituality, of Dante's soul, with the, the right direction towards the divine. So without a doubt, Dante here is uh, asking us to think about uh, Canto V of Inferno. That's what he's doing with, with these rhymes. At verse 13, confusion mixed with fear compelled a yes out of my mouth, and yet 
that yes was such, one needed eyes to make out what it was. It was so feeble that uh, if, you, if you didn't look at his lips moving, you wouldn't have noticed that he was saying yes. So it's the very first uh, weak and feeble admission of his sins. He is confirming what Beatrice said in the previous canto about him swaying away from uh, the right way. Finally, at verse 22, Beatrice asks him the most important question, the fundamental question. She says, in the desire for me that was directing you to love the good beyond which there's nothing to draw our longing, uh, what led you to lose your hope, to, to completely lose your hope? Basically, she's referring all the way back to the beginning of Canto One of Inferno, where Dante is in the middle of this dark wood, and he is in a complete crisis and he has no hope. If there is no absence of hope, there is no divine comedy. Uh, there is almost uh, no ability, I think, for the reader to properly understand the divine comedy. If we, as a person, have never felt, even for a short moment, uh, to be uh, never felt hopeless, the, the absence of hope. And so that's why I think it's really central that she tells him in Italian, um, Quai fossi attraversati, o quai catene trovasti, perché del passare innanzi dovestiti così spogliar la spene, dovestiti così spogliar la spene, meaning your loss of uh, any hope of moving forward was caused by what? When uh, the fact that I was in front of you had put you in the right, correct direction. Linguistically, it's also interesting what uh, Dante does here at verse uh, 29 and 30, because it's being translated very differently from translation to translation. I'm, I'm going to refer to Mandelbaum and Kirkpatrick here. Dante says, Nella fronte degli altri si mostraro, perché dovessi lor passeggiare anzi. This passeggiare anzi literally means uh, to walk in front of somebody. Mandelbaum says, uh, what benefits uh, were so evident upon the brow of others that you had need to promenade before them. So the sense here is that Dante is, was courting, was courting these earthly goods that were not real, properly uh, right goods. Um, and so promenade before them could be a way to say this concept. Kirkpatrick uses uh, at verse 31, the translation, you preferred to flounce within their sight. You preferred to flounce within their, within their sight. It's uh, another interesting way to resolve this uh, translation. So finally Dante decides to confess and his confession properly starts at verse number 30, 33. Piangendo dissi, le presenti cose col falso lor piacer volser miei passi, tosto che il vostro viso si nascose. Il vostro viso si nascose as soon as uh, your visage, as your face, hid itself, means as soon as you, Beatrice, were dead. The things of the earth, with their false beauty about them, uh, in fact, Dante is here repeating what Beatrice has accused him of doing in the previous canto. He, is, he has to do it, and again, a reader could say, why is he just repeating it? What's the, the, the point of this? But the point is the confession, the necessary required step of this confession purificating process where we have to say things out loud and not only for ourselves in the secret of our heart, but out loud in front of some kind of witness. Dante has Beatrice as a witness, but also the angels. And without the witness, there is no sense of shame. Here in this canto, the highlight, the double highlight, is on the importance of spiritual shame. That's why this passage, this step, is very important. Now, what Beatrice does here is to articulate uh, much better, in a deeper and more intense way, what she has already told Dante in the previous canto. And so she says at verse 49, Mai non ta presentò natura o arte piacer Quanto le belle membra, you've never seen beauty and you never felt a pleasure because of beauty higher than whenever you saw me when I was alive. 
And so we go back to this concept of uh, the, the beauty of love, and especially, I imagine, Dante is talking about looking in Beatrice's eyes while she was alive. He, never, he was never able to see anything more beautiful. Nothing on this earth had generated such a, a, a bigger, a higher pleasure than that for him. Nothing at all. And e se sommo piacer si ti fallio per la mia morte, qualcosa mortale dovea poi trarre te nel suo disio. If, if this highest pleasure that you felt because of my beauty was taken away from you because I was dead, I wasn't around anymore, then what mortal thing could then induce you to desire it? The, the logic is pretty stringent here. And here is the point that is most important of all. When she says, Ben ti dovevi, per lo primo strale delle cose fallaci, levar suso di retro a me che non era più tale. This is really the most, most important point. Mandelbaum says, um, When the first arrow of things, deceptive, struck you, then you surely should have lifted up your wings to follow me. No longer such a thing. In other words, she is telling him, my death should have already alerted you and make you, made you wake up to the truth that um, earthly things, any mortal thing, every, everything that is available here on earth is going to end up, is, is, is not going to lead you to an eternal happiness, to real, real eternal happiness. This was the lesson that you should have been able to, with your skills, with your intelligence, you should have been able to already learn by with my death. But you didn't. In fact, what happened to Dante, he turned towards a, a searching for something else that would give him the same type of pleasure or even higher. So, um, no green young girl, pargoletta. This pargoletta means really young girl. So she's referring to other young girls. If, we are not exactly sure if real, physical, or metaphorical, but it's very likely that it could be both. He should have been a fully-fledged bird, an adult, but Beatrice talks to him as a kid. Very beautiful here. Nuovo augelletto, due o tre aspetta. Nuovo augelletto, it's a little bird that is just born. Uh, when uh, the hunter or somebody who wants to catch him is trying to catch him, the new little bird will wait uh, until the, it's happened a couple of times or three times that they try to catch him before actually flying away because he doesn't have any experience. But somebody who's a, a fully fledged bird, who's an adult, like Dante was in this metaphor, should have realized immediately. Quali fanciulli vergognando? It's so interesting here, 64, where Dante says, even as children stand when they're ashamed, eyes to the ground, which makes me think maybe Maybe that was the case in his times. Today, I'm not sure if children still uh, are ashamed, eyes to the ground where they are, when they are reprimanded. Maybe some of them. Lift up your beard. Very interesting, this reference to beard, because it's, uh, it doesn't mean that Dante has a beard in this image, in this scene. Uh, Beatrice is talking about beard for two reasons. One, to say, hey, you are an adult. You are a man. And also in the sense of uh, you are a man she is uh, trying to leverage his uh, sense of uh, pride of being a man, his sense of uh, uh, virility. And that's why at the end he says, I knew quite well when she, when she said beard, but meant my face. The poison in an argument. So the allusion to his adult age stings even more to Dante because he's definitely the fully fledged bird in, in her simile. So what is it that makes finally Dante collapse and faint? It seems to be to the, the fact that Dante looks into Beatrice's face, even if the veil is still covering uh, part of it, she is still um, not looking at him. She's actually in this moment turned towards the griffin that symbolizes Jesus Christ. In this moment, he feels so much remorse and self-indictment that he faints. He senses um, slack and he, fell, and he falls to the ground. He, Faints. Um, he comes back to his senses and uh, he's already in the river, Lide, with uh, Matilda um, supporting him. And uh, she is saying, Hold on, hold on to me. 
Tienni, tienni. This is Matilda talking to Dante. It's beautiful here, verse number 96. Dante uses a word that is aqua lieve come scola. She is dragging him on the river as if he was a scola, which is almost like a gondola, a very light uh, boat. That's what he's comparing himself to. Once he's on the other side, uh, he heard asperges me, asperges me, that comes from Psalm 50, the miserere psalm in, in the Bible, which means purify me and cover me with water. The waters of the Levi, as we know, have the property of making all sins to be not only forgiven, but also forgotten by the sinner himself. The most important point of the second part of this canto, the way I think I understand it, is really the focus on Beatrice's eyes, what they mean, what they reflect, uh, and what they represent. Uh, first of all, Dante talks about her eyes as emeralds, and emerald, emeralds were also used as, um, uh, for their reflecting properties in Dante's times, so it wasn't rare to use them as a simile for mirrors, so they are mirroring something, they're reflecting something. Uh, once again, let's remember, Beatrice, at this point, she's still not looking in Dante's eyes. She's been speaking to him, she's been referring uh, to him, talking about him, etc., but never turned her eyes into his eyes yet, which I think is very, very powerful because it's almost as if Dante is feeling that power already, but he's dancing around it, still circling around it. And it's actually the three girls who represent the three theological virtues who are now guiding Dante to this final and crucial moment of the meeting of eyes, the meeting of the gaze between Dante's and Beatrice's. They say, see that you are not sparing of your gaze. Before you, we have set those emeralds, Beatrice's eyes as emeralds. So at this point, after having um, written 34 plus uh, 31 cantos of Inferno Purgatorio, in order to get to this moment when his eyes meet and connect with Beatrice's eyes. How is Dante going to be able to describe the sensation, the feeling that he has in his heart when this happens? In her eyes, he's seeing the reflection of the griffin in a different way from how he can see the griffin in reality, in that reality. In that reality, he sees simply the griffin in the two natures of eagle and lion. In her eyes, la doppia fiera dentro vi raggiava, or con altri, or con altri reggimenti. Mandelbaum says, now showing one and now the other guys. The griffin is showing its uh, eagle nature in one moment, and in another moment is showing its lion nature in the reflection in, Be in Beatrice's eyes. It's a way for Dante to express the fact that the human being can not really fully understand the divine and human nature that are uh, a single one thing, a unity in Jesus Christ. Um, the human being can see those two things separately, understand them separately, but not, but not the unity. By himself or by herself, a human being cannot understand it. This is why it's different the, the way that Beatrice can see it, that Beatrice can understand it, and the way that Dante can see it and understand it. Finally, only in Paradiso 33, Dante will be able to glimpse at, at this unity, at this concept of divine, divine and human in one single thing. Dante talks to the reader because, just like he does every time that he's uh, describing something that is so unimaginable and strange that sounds unreal, because he wants us to believe that this is all real, true and it happened. Consider, reader, if I did not wonder when I saw something displayed no movement, though its reflected image kept on changing in Beatrice's eyes. Finally, only at the very end of the canto, we have to get to verse 133 for Beatrice to finally decide to look at this poor guy's eyes. Uh, encouraged by the three theological, theological virtues, who say, turn Beatrice, or turn your holy eyes upon your faithful one, their song beseech, who, that he might see you, has come so far, he has done so much pilgrimage so far, just to see you, to see your eyes. So show him your eyes, look at him in, in the eyes. And so we have this final two tercets where 
um, Dante is describing for the first time in all this uh, uh, cantos that we've read in the Divine Comedy for the very first time, Dante has a brief glimpse of the Divine Grace directly through his looking into Beatrice's eyes. This is why the language here gets uh, really high and almost vague in its uh, lyricism. Is splendor di viva luce eterna. He will play a lot with light in Paradiso. So this is almost a glimpse of Paradiso that we have here in Purgatorio. Your face seen through the air, completely unveiled. Dante is saying what he's seeing when uh, Beatrice turns her eyes on him is almost as if he's seeing the divine. It's almost as if he is seeing Jesus Christ in her eyes. It's inexpressible. Personally, I, I do love the importance that uh, Dante gives to not only visuals in general, but uh, to Beatrice's eyes. Her, her eyes being the real portal, the real guide for him to go in the right direction. Um, so often um, in my life, just to share personally, I've noticed how the look, the gaze or the eyes of especially of a woman, because I consider in general women to tendentially be wiser than men, uh, to indicate the right and just much more than anything else on earth anything else that we can find, see, understand and discover on this earth. And particularly the eyes of somebody whom we love, uh, the eyes of somebody who has a very special meaning for us and for our heart, for our soul. And so they reflect and they build a certain loop between them, themselves, the eyes and our eyes. And in this loop, in this relationship, there is a glimpse of the divine, there is a glimpse of God. This is the truth that Dante is uh, hinting at here. Um, I tried to uh, articulate a couple of thoughts about this uh, really, really beautiful canto. Um, please let me know what you think, and especially let me know if you have questions or points that you'd like to discuss further with me. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll uh, speak again very soon for canto 32.